And happy Sabbath to everyone. Uh, we greet you in the name of the Lord, our Savior, Lord, Redeemer, and King. And uh, at this moment, uh, I would like for us to just pause a moment and uh, in respect of God and His Word, uh, let us bow our head uh, in reverence as we pray. Heavenly Father, you promise that you will not leave us comfortless. Yes. Yeah will allow the Holy Spirit and lead us into all truth. So thank you, Lord, for moving and walking on our behalf. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you will grant us greater understanding of your word and clarity as we summarize this week's lesson. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the title of this week's lesson is The Bible, the Authoritative Source of Our Theology. Now, this is the fourth lesson for the second quarter of uh, 2020, which, you know, will be April, May, and June. But just to remind us, the entire quarter's lesson is designed 
or should I say written to help us learn how to interpret scripture. Well, folks, we have but a few minutes to uh, snack on what we have studied all week, uh, what we have had marinating for uh, the past six days. Uh, so in a few minutes, let's, um, let's see how we can probably break down the study for this week and apply it to ourselves, you know, make that personal application. For it is of no benefit to us if we are just studying and we are not able to apply what we right. have. And so, <coughs> excuse me, I do not have anything. I'm just letting you know that so you don't have to put on your masses. If I'll begin by uh, posing a question, a question just for our contemplation as we begin. So, based on what we have studied, or even if we haven't studied, based on these sources, which of these sources do you think we should allow to influence our theology? Should we allow tradition, experience, culture, reason, or the Bible? I'll say that once more. Which of these sources do you think we should allow to influence our theology? Tradition, experience, culture, reason, or the Bible? Probably I can ask this question another way. In matters of our faith and the practice of our faith, how we live, what we believe, which of those sources, tradition, experience, culture, reason, or the Bible, should have an influence on us? And I really want you to think about it because your answer, uh, my answer to that question will help to unfold four main points that this week's lesson is teaching us about the broader concept of understanding. How to now, the simple answer to the question is that all of those sources contribute to the development of our theology, our beliefs, our religion, our outlook on life, how we live our lives. But the deeper answer to that question, combined with what we have studied for the week, will produce these four main points. One, all the sources, tradition, experience, culture, reason, the Bible, all have an influence on our theology. The second point that the week's lesson is trying to bring out to us is that all of those sources have positive influences, but they also have negative influences, <coughs> well, except the Bible, of course, which only have a positive influence. The third point for the week's lesson is that the priority, the priority that we give, the priority that we give any source or combination of sources will significantly shape our theology and will ultimately determine what we believe, what we think, and really how we live our lives. And the fourth point that the lesson uh, is bringing out to us for this week is that the Bible, the Bible, God's holy word, is the authoritative source. It is the standard. It is the test. It is the the um, 
measuring rod by which all of the other sources are to be tested. It is the word of God. Therefore, when any of these other sources come in conflict with the word of God, brothers and sisters, we need to choose God's word. For it is the foundation on which, not just a foundation, it is the firm foundation on which we are to stand. Now our memory text for the week comes from Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 20. And uh, if you have it, uh, you can say it with me. Um, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20, it says, uh, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And so right here, Isaiah is uh, establishing the, the, the word of God as that test, as that measuring rod on which we are to base and test every other source. Now, it is interesting that um, Isaiah lists two, <coughs> two different um, aspects of the scripture as he begins this statement. First, he says, to the law, that's one, and then he says, to the testimony. And in so doing, Isaiah is incorporating the entire scripture, not just the commandments, not just the law of God, but everything that testifies of God and his dealing with, uh, with mankind throughout the ages uh, that have passed, at present and for the future. And so he combines them in the next part of the text when he says, if they do not speak according to this word. Now he makes it into that singular entity, the law, the testimony, and now he calls it this word, speaking about God's word. So Isaiah is there emphasizing the point that we ought to test everything by the word of God. So that is really the lesson in a nutshell, and um, I think we can end here, but uh, obviously we do have some time, so we need to uh, just break the shell and get into uh, the week's lesson as we uh, try to this day. And so, Pastor, I know that you you have you have those slides and i would like to use those slides also um uh that we have for the week's lesson and so we want to begin with tradition uh tradition which is covered on the sunday's uh lesson uh tradition Tradition are those customs and beliefs that we practice that are passed on from generation to generation. And so the question is, um, if we are influenced in our theology by tradition, what are some of those good things about uh, tradition? What are some of those good things about tradition? And so we have, uh, we can learn from tradition because it helps us to remember our history. It also reminds us of the lessons learned by our ancestors. So when, when we think about, about um, the United States, and uh, not even the United States, but um, uh, our black heritage, uh, we can think about the month of February, and, and we, we often refer to that as not just the love month, but we call it also, I hope I'm getting this right, I'm not even forgetting my history, but the Black, Black History Month, and so 
this in itself is a tradition that helps us remember our history and remind us of the lessons learned by our ancestors. And, and if we are to go through scripture, we will also uh, see in scripture uh, traditions in the Bible that remind, reminded the people of God of their liberation. Uh, for example, we have the uh, Purim, which we know was established um, uh, in the days of Esther uh, when God moved mightily through Esther and she was able to be a, 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 a type of Christ in bringing about the salvation of the Jewish nation at that time. And so Purim was established to celebrate that deliverance that was wrought at that time. But we can even go back further in Scripture and we can look at the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, and we can see, and we do know that uh, in, in, in Exodus, in those early chapters of Exodus, that God himself instituted the Passover. And, and so that was a tradition that God himself established uh, for the Jewish people as a reminder of his salvation that he wrought when he brought them out of Egypt. And so uh, there are traditions in the Bible uh, that remind pe uh, reminded the people of God about their uh, liberation. Uh, here in the United States also, we do have um, uh, what we celebrate every year about the arrival of the Pilgrim Fathers um, uh, to, land, to the land of freedom. And, and yes, it is still remembered even to this day. But yes, think about it for a moment that there are those traditions that uh, as we grew up uh, became more or less a part of us uh, that helped to develop and to shape what we think of religion, how we think of God and otherwise. For example, this idea that our pastors or bishop or priests or, or elders should know best was born out of this concept that yes that elder, that pastor, that leader should be a man of God and should know the scriptures is it always true that each minister and each teacher, each leader, each priest really know the scripture not always but we give them this place that they should know best. And so um, I, I think of, um, I think it was a, a sitcom or something that says, uh, uh, was entitled Father Knows Best. And, and, and believe it or not, that part of tradition has influenced how we often relate to our ministers in our churches. And so uh, we take, we take it very often, 100%, that whatever the minister says has to be the gospel truth. But Paul, the apostle, the mighty evangelist, reminds us of something important when he, when he traveled between Thessalonica and the Berians. He says of one group that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that even while he had preached to them, they were not satisfied they went home and they opened the word and they studied for themselves. And so, yes, tradition greatly influences how we, how we um, develop our theology and our understanding of God and the scriptures. Think about traditions even today in our churches. And the question at the bottom of Sunday's lesson asks, what are the things that we do as a church that could be understood? Let me just repeat that. What are the things we do as a church that could be put under the label tradition? And a follow-up question, why is it always important to distinguish them from a biblical teaching? Bring your answers to class and Sabbath. I'm sorry we can't have all those answers, but I just want to share with you 
uh, one uh, tradition that I know that um, uh, the Lord himself has instituted, and that is communion. And, uh, and this was instituted by the Lord um, when he had that last meal with his uh, disciples. And, and we know that Paul in, in, in Corinthians um, uh, refers to this tradition, and, um, and we practice it today. In fact, this is a tradition that will take us even into eternity, because the Lord did say to his disciples that I will not eat uh, 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 a drink of this of the vine with you once more uh, until I do so in paradise with you. So we look forward to that tradition continuing. But think about certain traditions uh, that we have in the church that um, is not really biblical, but we do practice. And the one that I simple one that I can think about is why do we wear white or black for communion? That is a tradition. It's not biblical. There's nothing that says Jesus had white or the disciples had black. But it's just a, a tradition that we have in the church. And I know the, the sentiments about it that, you know, uh, it's a coming of uh, As it were, we are celebrating his death and, and burial. That's what he said. But I just want us to know that that is a tradition that we have in the church, but it is not really biblical. But then we do have the experience where we have to admit that there are things that are bad about tradition. And so tradition gets to that point of being bad when they take the place of truth by adding false elements and superstitions to the faith. So, so we have this example in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. And so here we have this discussion between Jesus and those gathered um, uh, and the leaders of the day. And, and they're here condemning Jesus because his disciples did not wash their hands before they ate. We, we are reminded that this had nothing to do with proper hand hygiene uh, as we are required to do even in this time of uh, COVID-19 uh, where we really need to wash our hands. But that discussion had nothing to do with hygiene. It had more to do with traditions. And, and so what was the tradition? Uh, if we remember, if we can go back to, to those early books of the Bible uh, where, where God instituted the laws of the temple service, uh, he required of the priests that uh, before they go in to minister, they should wash their hands, they should wash their feet so that they may be clean before the Lord that he may not strike them down dead when they go in to minister before him. Well, the, the, the Jewish leaders uh, through the centuries uh, uh, fell away from, from that tradition as it were and placed it on the entire Jewish society. And so they instituted um, more of a ritual form of cleansing by washing of the hands and washing of pots and other things, which was not prescribed through scripture. And so this was a tradition that the place and um, uh, practice that even in the time of Jesus, uh, they seek to condemn the disciples for not following their man-made traditions, and that was what Jesus was speaking about. Uh, but how did Jesus um, uh, how did Jesus react? He reacted by stating scripture and how the, the leaders had gone away from the teaching of scriptures and instead have placed these fall elements and superstitions above the teachings of scripture. And so Jesus himself used the scripture as that authoritative source that should help to form our theology. And so... <coughs> 
traditions, though they have a, 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 a good place in helping to influence or or, or beliefs, uh, the way we live, the way we view God, they are not the authoritative source. And sooner or later, our traditions are going to come in conflict uh, with the truth of God based on his word if they are man-made. And so we have to be able to use the word of God as the standard, as the test, as the measuring rod that should uh, make the difference as to whether I should hold on to this tradition, whether I should uplift or support this tradition uh, varies uh, or, or compared to what the Word of God says. And so, again, tradition is not bad. Tradition is given a bad name because of how it is um, misused and abused in being placed above God's word and adding elements that, that are against God's word. But tradition of itself is not bad. However, the living word of God should stand as the authoritative source when it comes between deciding what traditions we should hold on to. And so we, we should move on to experience. Experience. And so, what were the takeaways from experience? What are the takeaways from experience? Uh, Galatians 4.15 says, What then uh, was the blessing uh, you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So, so that's Paul speaking uh, in Galatians 4.15. And so from Monday's lesson, uh, we can take out uh, these few points. One, God, God designed us in such a way that our relationship to his creation, to him, is significantly connected to and shaped by our experience. Let me repeat that. God designed us in such a way that our relationship to his creation, to him, and to him is significantly connected to and shaped by our experience. And the second point from Monday's lesson is that Our experience with God shapes our understanding of Him. Our experience with God shapes our understanding of Him. Also, taken out of Monday's lesson based on experience as a basis for aiding our theological development, remembering how God helped us and encouraged us in the past moves us towards our goal. Remembering how God helped us and encouraged us in the past moves us toward our goal. And we can, we can, we can look at uh, texts like Romans 2, verse 4. We can look at Titus 3, uh, verses 4 and 5, as, as is outlined in the lesson. And it speaks to this experience of having an experience with God. Now we can think about uh, 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 or taste and see that the Lord is good. If we don't taste, then we won't know how good he is. And so our experience in life with God helps us better understand his word. Our experience in life helps us with God, helps us better understand his word. And so what is bad about experience? Not all experiences are good. Sometimes the things we experience and feel don't come from God. Uh, if we could, just for a quick moment, just reflect on, on Job's experience. Remember Job's friends? They were basically saying that bad things only happen to you if you live bad and commit a sin. And, and so one would think if that was true, then Jesus must have been really, really bad. 
but God forbid that I should even entertain uh, such a thought. Uh, but we know that because of sin, bad things happen to everybody. Yes, we know that a person will reap what they sow in their own time, but we, 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 we don't get sick because of something, uh, uh, some sin we commit per se, uh, unless it is a result of what we did. But yes, bad things happen to everybody because of sin, the existence of evil in this present world. Uh, and so this virus that is going around, is it choosing those who, 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 um, who worship God faithfully uh, or, or who, who return a faithful tithe or an offering? I mean, just leaving them alone? No, no, no. This, this virus has, no, has no, 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 no selection. Whoever it lays hold on will get sick. If your immune system is not strong enough, you will die save God intervening on your behalf. And so, experience are not always good. And so, I, 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 I thought to think of, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to move a little too fast, so I'm, I'm even mixing up myself and my words, uh, because I'm trying to get it all out. And so, not all experiences are good. You have hate, you have evil, you have slander, you have cussing, you have pain. You, you, you can experience strife, you can experience hypocrisy, you can experience hurt, you can experience loss, you can experience disappointment. How I react to, to, to these negatives can also shape my theology. And so it means that if I rely solely on my experience, then I may just see God in a bad light. For example, I, I know of individuals who, who, who have looked to elders and, and, and pastors, uh, uh, different members of the church, uh, and, and set them on a pinnacle and, and then became hurt by those individuals and leave the church. Why? Because now they were basing their relationship on God of what they see by that person. And when that person failed, then they see God as being like that. And so, uh, once more, we cannot trust solely on our experiences to fully form our theology. And so, yes, it's an imp important part of our, ex of our life to have experiences because God wants us to experience experience him. He wants us to experience his love, his compassion, his joy, his mercy, uh, uh, to, to experience fellowship. Uh, but yes, somewhere along the pathway of life, bad experiences will take place. It does not mean that God is treating us bad. It does not mean that God is, it, it doesn't love us. And so, if we, if we limit ex, um, or, or, or theology just to experience, we can be led astray. And so um, our faith and our doctrines, we cannot solely lead up to experiences. If they contradict the Bible, then that is dangerous ground. And so we need, even with our experiences, to have our experiences based on what Scripture is telling us, what Scripture is guiding and directing us. Then we have culture. As we have 10 minutes more, we have culture. Culture is that outlook, that those attitudes, those traditions, values, morals, goals, and customs, that are shaped by a society. In other words, it, it, it's the way of living uh, life, um, how this group does things. And so, if you would permit me just a brief moment to, to, to vent, uh, vent some cultural biases, um, uh, just bear with me. If I am to say jerk chicken, Bronx stew, 
oxtail, and I can imagine all those with Caribbean connection might be saying it's not only Jamaica, that could be any Caribbean island, but if I, I, I dare to say Bob Marley, then everybody will say Jamaica. Uh, if I say green, bagpipe, kilts, bear drinking, one might think to think Scottish or Irish. What if I said, don't smoke? Ten Commandments. E.G. White. Don't walk on Saturday. Don't eat pork. 2,300 days. Prophecy. No jewelry. Don't drink rum. Uh, buy home uh, at sundown Friday. Don't drink Pepsi, don't drink coffee, don't eat pork. Yes, I said it again. One would want to say, yes, that's the Adventist culture, or used to be the Adventist culture. And so, what is good about culture? Is there anything good about culture? In some countries, the culture has been strongly influenced by the Bible. Uh, Talk about here in the United States, and, 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 and yes, the laws of the land have been influenced by the culture. After all, uh, we, we say it around the time of uh, independence, that all men are created equal, and you, you know the rest of it. Uh, but, but yes, uh, culture in some countries have been strongly influenced by the Bible. In many other countries, and we're just looking at the good points of culture, in many countries, we find cultural elements that are compatible with the Bible teachings. And, and, and so there is reason for us to be able to take those good elements of culture and, 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 and as they influence our theology, they help to lead us to the scripture. But there are bad things about culture. Unfortunately, our culture may consider some things that are wrong as right, and some things that are right as wrong. Isaiah 5.20 points that out. And so, every cultural element, no matter how good it is, no matter how, 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 how nice it seems, must be checked with the Bible. And the Bible must prevail. We may improve our culture, but we should never change the Bible. We, should, we can improve our culture, but we should never change the Bible. And so... We are coming down to reason. Or reasoning, I would, I would prefer to, to say, because a reason could be uh, a, a, another way of um, uh, why something happened. But um, the reason that they're talking about uh, in the lesson, or reasoning, is the capacity to reason. The power of the mind to think, understand, and form, judge, form judgment uh, by a person uh, by a process of logic, sorry. And so, what are those good things about uh, reasoning? Second uh, Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient uh, to Christ. Uh, so those good things about reasoning. Reasoning is a gift from God. We can use it to reach right conclusions and to be convinced of the truth. Uh, I mean, it's the Lord who says, come, let us reason together. Let us reason together. Let, let us think this thing through. Uh, let us see the, the pluses and the minuses, the good and the bad. Let's come to a conclusion. Let's reason together. And so God has given us that gift of reasoning. Reasoning makes us wise if they are subjected to God's will. Proverbs 
9 and verse 10 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Uh, even in our worship, according to Romans 12 and verse 1, we are to be rational. Not only emotional, but also rational. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so, what's bad about reason? Why can reason be dangerous? It's very dangerous to believe that we can understand everything with our reason alone. You know, I know it all. I am Father Noah. I just know. And so that is dangerous ground. You see, uh, the, the other thing about reason is that we have a God who says, my ways are not your ways. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, and so sometimes God acts in supernatural ways that we cannot rationalize. How in the world did Jesus walk on water? I mean, I've been trying that all my life, trying to run as fast as I can. doesn't work. Uh, uh, um, how, does, how did he raise the dead to life? Uh, how did he open the eyes of a blind man by spitting on the ground and, and making mud and placing it over his eyes? Can't explain that. If we systematically reject these miracles of God, we may move away from what he wants, from who he wants, let me just get that again. If we systematically reject these miracles, we may move away from him who wants to give us salvation and everlasting life. So, brothers and sisters, we cannot just depend on reasoning alone as, as that main source of our theology. Yes, God wants us to think. Yes, he wants us to, to, to figure things out, to test things, to try things. But our reasoning, our thinking has to be subjected to the word of God. And that's why we come to the Bible, which is the last entity, the Bible. <clears throat> Jesus said uh, to those gathered in John 5, 46, If you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote about me. Here Jesus is again confirming the scripture. So what is good about the scripture? It is the, 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 the source that Jesus asks us to go to. He asks us to study it. Uh, uh, yes, John 5, 39 says, uh, You search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which tes testify of me. Jesus was saying, don't just search the scriptures to know the scripture. Search the scripture to find him who is able to give you life. And so that's why he said um, in verse 46, For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. What else is good about our scripture? It's the word inspired by God. It is useful for teaching. You know, we, we know this text, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. For all scripture, is, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction. In matters of faith and doctrine, the Bible is above tradition, it's above experience, it's above culture and reason. All of them must be evaluated and analyzed uh, with the Bible <clears throat> And what is bad about the Bible Brothers and sisters There is nothing bad About scripture It is always uh, Led And inspired by the Holy Spirit And the Holy Spirit Will never lead us Wrong It will never lead us He will never lead us against the truth Experience May lead us against the truth Tradition may lead us against the truth. Culture may lead us against the truth. Reason or a very thinking may lead us against the truth. But the scriptures through the Holy Spirit will never lead us the truth of God. <clears throat> and so 
I want to end by uh, reading this, uh, this uh, section on the Friday that says, Tradition, experience, culture, reason, and the Bible are all present in our reflection on the Word of God. But we need to ask a decisive question. Which of these sources has the final say and the ultimate authority in our theology? It is one thing to affirm the Bible, but it is something else altogether to allow the Bible through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to impact and change the life. Uh, and, and yes, as I close, I am convinced that every source that we have, have, have studied about this week and I have just tried to quickly go through or uh, run through is found and encapsulated in, in, in what Jesus was trying to, to, to explain to us when he started in Matthew chapter 5, I think somewhere up until chapter 7 or chapter 8. Jesus was trying to, to, to get us to understand what is the culture of heaven. What are the traditions of heaven? What are the experiences that heaven wants you to experience? What are the... the, the what are the, the, the culture, the, 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 the customs, the practices of heaven? What is the, the thinking of heaven should be? And so I pray, brothers and sisters, that we should not allow any argument of man to turn us away from a thorough investigation of Bible truth. The opinions, the custom of men are not to be received as of divine authority. God has revealed in his word what is the whole duty of man. And we are not to be swayed from the great standard of righteousness. He sent his only begotten son to be our example and bid us to hear and follow him. Brothers and sisters, I conclude that the Bible is indeed that authoritative source of our theology. So let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the study of your word. We pray, Lord Jesus, that um, you will continue to make your word plain to us, Lord. And as we lift up uh, the Bible, as we lift up your word, Lord, um, our traditions, our, our, our experiences, uh, our customs, uh, our culture, uh, our reasoning, Lord, will always be subjected to you and what you say in your word. Thank you for leading and directing us before in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Elder John. I appreciate uh, the words that you lifted on today. Uh, thank you so much for allowing the Holy Spirit to use you uh, to remind us of the vision that the Bible should have. You stated uh, in your uh, um, the question, and that is, which has the final say in our theology? And that is really important for us to meet out because a lot of, uh, as you talked about it, a lot of denominations are running around and formulating off of opinion, off of culture, off of what makes me feel good, and that is dangerous. Uh, I don't think we should ever come to the Bible, as you stated so clearly within this study, and just simply say, I don't agree with that, and I'm moving on and doing my own thing. Uh, that's dangerous. Uh, thank you again, Elder uh, John, for leading us into the understanding that the Bible should be our foundation. It's the end-all, be-all standard. Uh, stock and block for what we do and how we live and how we move and have our being as the Bible says. We can't afford to run around here talking about, well, the Bible uh, doesn't line up with my culture. Um, that's uh, foolishness. Um, it's a fallacy. It is falsehood. And, and quite frankly, uh, that is where we are getting into um, as we're getting closer to the end. A lot of people are just saying, hey, I, I feel this way about the Bible. And so um, that that's where I am now predicating my belief on. And um, again, uh, that is uh, dangerous. You also stated um, how God has helped us in the past and moves us towards our goal. Um, it does. I believe that even as we read the Bible, we need to understand that we're reading our cultural, um, our uh, genesis, as you will, and understanding how God has led us in the past as the human race. Now, uh, I am a racist, 
And uh, let me say that again, I am a racist, and I believe in the human race. Um, I believe that God has verified and quantified and created the human race. Uh, thereby, I am for God's people. I'm for all people, as a matter of fact, uh, because he is, um, and according to his word, if we read the Bible, we'll understand who we are. And once we understand who we are, we can move towards our goal. It will unify once we quantify that through our biblical understanding. So, again, thank you, John, uh, Elder John, for uh, leading us into the word of Christ and uh, helping us to get a reaffirmed foundation uh, that the Bible is our standard. It is our standard. I can't say it enough. It is our standard for all truth. I don't care about miracles. I don't care about how it made you feel. Uh, the Bible is true. And so, again, thank you again, uh, Elder John. I want to uh, go to our COVID update. Um, Dr. Jude, if you don't mind uh, unmuting yourself and uh, jumping on the line, I wanted to uh, just give us a, a brief COVID update, and after that we will go to our dear Sister Parsons staying up in down times. Okay. <clears throat> can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, I can. Oh, happy Sabbath. <clears throat> happy Sabbath. Yes. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk briefly about um, what is happening. Um, I have three important points I'm going to talk about. First is the environment. Second is the race. And third, we'll look at some statistics. Now let's delve into the statistics. Today, right now, uh, we have about 2.8 million confirmed cases around the world, and those recovered, 799,000, deaths, 198. In the U.S., we have about 927,000 cases, recovered 101,000, deaths, 52,415. North Carolina, confirmed cases, 8,052. Recovered zero, dead 269. Guilford County, confirmed cases 272. Recovered zero, dead 16. So the data suggests that the number of cases is increasing over time. Now let's move on to the effect of sunlight on the virus. Before it became known that the virus was spreading, a lot of people had said when uh, the temperature would increase, the virus may disappear. Let's look at a study which was conducted. U.S. scientists say coronavirus dies the fastest when it's exposed to direct sunlight. Though a study cited has not yet been made public and await external evaluation, but it's known that ultraviolet rays had a potent impact on the pathogen, offering hope its spread may ease over the summer. It has long been known that ultraviolet light has a sterilizing effect because the radiation damages the virus's genetic material and its ability to replicate. We know that. We have seen similar effect with both temperature and humidity as well. Where increasing the temperature and humidity of both is generally less favorable to the virus. That's good news. But a key question would be, what intensity and wavelength of the UV light used in the experiment was and whether this accurately make natural light conditions in summer? So it was an experiment which was conducted showing that sunlight and humidity negatively affect the virus. But that the conditions they used were laboratory condition. But we don't really know if that same condition could be found in the environment. It could or it could not. Let's wait and see. And before this weekend, people have talked about the effect of disinfection 
But let's look at what it is, what these infections are. These infections are antimicrobial agents designed to inactivate or destroy microorganisms on inlet surfaces. As you're using the disinfectant on the surface. But what happens if you inject disinfectant or if you consume disinfectant, will you get rid of the virus? The answer is a big no. Injecting bleach or any disinfectant will cause massive organ damage and the blood cells in your body will be destroyed. So don't think about consuming or injecting disinfectant into your body. Before COVID-19 became known around the world, a lot of people have said the black, blacks do not contract the virus, or even if the virus is found in black, the blacks will still survive. But let's look at the statistics today, what is happening. Blacks in about every state with racial data available have higher contraction rates and higher death rates of COVID-19. Blacks relative to whites are more likely to live in neighborhoods with lack of healthy food options, green spaces, recreational facilities, lightning, and safety. Blacks are more likely to live in densely populated areas further heightening their potential contract with other people. They represent about one quarter of all. So those people who believe that blacks could not contract the virus, or even if the blacks are exposed to the virus, they can still survive. It's not true. Statistics today have shown that the number of higher percentages of blacks contract the virus and are dying. So sometimes we really have to think before saying something. And my advice to you is that we should look at all the preventive methods make use of those methods to avoid being exposed to the virus. I have the slogan, only God can help us. Thank you very much. To Jude for leading us uh, in that. Um, we, we believe that even in these last days, as you stated, God is going to be the one um, who leads us uh, through this valley. We believe it. Um, I hope that you, if you do not believe it, I hope that you will fall in line with that. Uh, there is no other help except the help of God, and we certainly do need to be mindful that in these last days there will be revivals. There will be a false one and a true one. True one. Uh, we need to line up with what is true. Thank you again, Dr. Jude. Uh, at this time, I'm going to throw the uh, floor to staying up in down times, our mental health moment. Uh, Sister Parsons is going to lead us into something I think is very essential. Uh, Sister Parsons, are you on the line? Why, yes, I am, Pastor. Oh, How are you awesome. this morning? Doing well. How about you? Great. I'm great. I'm great. All right. Um, good morning, church family. Um, this morning, we are pausing for a mental health moment on staying up and down times. Just want to thank the pastor again for these precious moments today. Um, here we are again, yet another week of sheltering in place. Some of us are fine again, but others are close to losing it, especially when um, we have all of our kids at the house and everyone and all the family is needing something different and um, they want something and everybody don't want something at the same time. So, Lord, help us. Well, this is the time that the Lord has given us to sharpen our coping skills with God to bring us through it all. Another way to look at it, last week we talked about Christian meditation and how uh, Christian meditation is different from the world. Uh, we as Christians are to meditate on God's word. Um, I'm hoping that someone was able to find the time and space um, this past week to practice the coping skills on meditating with God. Uh, this week I want to talk about journaling as a Christian or Christian journaling. What do you mean? I'm so glad you asked that question. Christian journaling or journaling as Christian writing is writing or noting things that are important or concerning to us to talk to God about. 
Christian, um, let's see, you talked to God about journaling is good to write down your thoughts, scriptures, prayers, what God has done for you in your life, even notes from the pastor um, that was talked about in church, et cetera. There's so much that we can write in our Christian journal. So, so whenever you have a problem or you've forgotten or you want to be reminded about something, you can always go back and read it again about how you were brought through. So where do we begin? Some things that you're going to need. You're going to need a journal, a notebook, writing utensil, or a computer for you new age people. Um, you're also going to need time and space, preferably a quiet one. Um, next, you're going to you want to structure how you want to journal. You're going to pick or decide what to journal about according to who you are and your personality. Um, just a couple of ideas that that, are, that I have um, to throw out there: journaling about anything that concerns you in that moment. That's that's my favorite thing to do is, well, God, I'm, I'm trying to do this or I'm trying to do that or thank you, God, or uh, for something that has happened or, you know, so journal about and write about anything that is happening in the moment, day-to-day -day kind of things. Um, write down things you would like to share with God, thoughts, questions, and ideas, or, hey, I just thought about this, God, or what do you think about it? Um, the next idea that I have is journaling your prayers. Um, or um, what you receive after you have gotten into the word or meditation. Write down your prayers to God, writing down Bible verses, inspired words after meditating on God's word. Um, another one would be journaling by theme. And some people are really, really structured in where they want to write about, this week I'm writing about love, this week I'm writing about my faith walk, or this year, or forgiveness, or something in a theme manner. So they want to write about that on a consistent basis. Um, I would like to think that God gave us an example of journey when he wrote with his finger the Ten Commandments. They are written down so that whenever we have a problem or concern, we can go back and read his journals to us. Um, just want to leave um, that with you, and I want to leave this as well. It doesn't really matter what you put in your journals as long as you are journaling with God. So just want to leave that with you. Staying up in downtimes, your mental health moment. Uh, again, thank you, Sister Parsons, for leading us uh, into that. What I think is very important, it's valuable, in that uh, we, we need to uh, set aside time to journal, um, something that I have recently started, and um, it really helps me to get through my prayer language. So sometimes I get caught in my own thoughts. Uh, my words uh, just don't, they fail in comparison and pale in comparison to what my emotional state might be. But I, I do uh, believe, in, and thank you so much, uh, because you get to write out your full course of thinking. So maybe you're not just journaling about uh, what it is that you're feeling that day. Uh, maybe you're journaling your prayers and um, being able, like you said, to be able to go back and verify the blessings of the Lord because we are forgetful, and that's why God commissioned Moses to begin to write um, because uh, you know, we, we forget, and we don't put down stones like we used to uh, with our forefathers and being able to go back and say what mean these stones. Um, journaling are those stones. Being able to write out your prayers, whether write out how you are feeling throughout the day, really makes a genuine difference. So, again, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Sister Parsons, for leading us in that. Uh, we do have a special music, and then I want to jump into it. Uh, Purify our hearts, Lord. Purify our hearts, Lord. That's our prayer. Sanctify our hearts, Lord. Come in this place, won't you? Sanctify our hearts, Lord. This is where it gets personal. It says, um, Oh Lord, we need you. We need to see you. We're desperate for you. Now 
now let your glory settle here, right here, settle here. Come on, sing. Purify our hearts, Lord. This is a simple song, simple song. Purify, purify our hearts, Lord. Come on, the next verse says, sanctify our hearts. Sanctify our hearts, Lord. Come on, God, won't you sanctify our hearts? Sanctify our hearts, Lord. Make it personal. Oh, Lord, we need you. Oh, we need you. Come on, come on in this place. We need to see you. We need to see you. We're desperate for you. We're desperate for you. Come on, now let your glory. Now let your glory settle here. Would you make that your prayer today? Want them to settle here. Settle here. In our worship, settle right here in our worship, God. Settle here. Settle here. Come on, settle here, God. Settle here. Come on, Easter Market, let's sing. Purify my heart. Purify Make it personal. Heart, Make it Lord. personal. Purify, purify my heart. Purify my heart, Lord. Won't you sanctify our hearts? Sanctify my heart, Lord. Sanctify. Oh Lord, we need oh Lord, you. We need you. Yes, God. Yes, God. We need to see, we need to you. see you. Is anybody desperate for His presence? We're desperate for We're you. Desperate for you. Now let Your glory settle me. That rough place in your life, would you like God to settle it for you? Settle here. That, that thing you haven't even given up to God yet. Tell him to. Tell him to settle here. And then right there in the midst of your mess, settle here. settle here. Come on, now let your glory. Now let your glory settle here. There's a place in this song we're going to tell God that he is mighty, he is majestic. We want him to come down and see about us. Come on. Come on and take a seat. Come on, sing it up. Come on and take your seat. Come on, sing that part. Our burden that you With you, feet. we can't be beat. With you, we can't be beat. Come on and settle Look here, God. Settle. You can settle here. Come on and take your seat. Take a seat right in the our middle of our mess, God. With you, With Lord. You, we can't be beat. Won't you settle? Won't you settle? Won't you settle? You can With you, Lord, won't you settle? You can settle. Come on and take your seat. Come on, our burden. We're gonna lay them right down here with you. Come on and say, you can settle. Come on and take your seat. Our burdens, Lord. We're gonna lay them at your feet, Master. Who won't you settle? You can settle here. You want him to settle in your in your in your lives today. Here, that's all we're giving it to him. Everything that we need him, he's ready and he's able to prepare for us. Come on, he's gonna settle here. And uh, thank you so much again uh, for being here with us. Uh, this is uh, verifiably. Uh, the last moments of Earth's history, um, you know, we don't say that to scare anyone. Uh, we say that because it is the truth. And uh, the Bible has told us this, not because of COVID-19, but he says, as you see these signs, uh, we'll be able to verify uh, where we are in Earth's history. Revelation chapter 7, if you don't mind turning there, I want to encourage you from the word of God on today. Uh, there are some words that I want to uh, share with you. And... Um, 
Revelation 7. Our message from last week will be in lieu to the message that I'm going to share with you. Uh, let me get my technology straight here. And there we go. All right. There we are. Okay. All right. I want to look at Revelation chapter 7, 9 through 15. Uh, Sister uh, Robin Patterson, if uh, you get your on audio straight by the end, I'll try to lead back into you. You can close us out with a word in song. Um, again, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 15. Uh, the Bible says, be ye ready at all times. So you got to be ready, have to have the word of truth. I uh, hope that you had a victorious week. Uh, nonetheless, the situations do not dictate our victory, as we will find out in our word today. Uh, Revelation 7, 9 through 15. Now, let me start with verse 1, as we were talking about on last week. It says, I, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. Uh, 7, verse 1, uh, that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, which is very important in these last days. Um, all of us are either uh, repelling the seal or we're attracting the seal uh, of God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till I have sealed the servants of God. The Bible says, it's very important where he seals us. It's in our where, in our forehead. That's the seat of our authority. That is where we make decisions. And every decision, it quantifiably, is saying to us, every decision that we make is really uh, or really constitutes whether or not we are, in fact, ready to receive this covering from God. So not only do we get the seal of God, which is, yes, in essence, his line uh, item, his signature upon our lives, but we are also afforded this covering of God. Uh, this covering of God uh, helps us not to be hurt by these winds that are coming upon the earth, and uh, certainly we're feeling a breeze uh, right now as we're facing some of these trying times. But let me get to a portion of the text, verse 9 through 15. I hope you came to enjoy the word today. I'm not going to rush through this if you've got to go. Uh, you know how to exit stage left, but uh, nonetheless, I hope that you'll stay by. I want to fill you with some true encouragement. Um, I want to walk through this. I don't want to be rushed. I don't want to feel the pressure that I feel most of the time in church. I don't want to take all day either. Uh, let me assure you of that, but I want you to get the point of these messages. This is part two of These Are They, No Excuses or no excuse for victory. This is Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 15. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb of God, clothed with, the, the, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. That's something that I really want you to pay attention to. And they cried out with a loud voice. Listen to what they say. Salvation belongs to our God. Hallelujah, someone. Salvation belongs to our God. Now, they didn't run around and in a great fear and anticipation of what the last days were to bring. Uh, they weren't scared. They were not uh, running around frantically trying to do this and that. Uh, these individuals and this great multitude that were wearing white robes, they were holding, uh, the Bible says, palm branches in their hands, and, and they cried with a loud voice. They weren't crying out in exclamations of their terror. They were crying out in worship, and I think that's a word for someone in this season right now who needs to understand that this is not a time for you to be running around frantic and scared. You need to know where your salvation lies. Hallelujah, someone. And they say salvation belongs to our God. They didn't say the Sunday law. They didn't say the end of time. They didn't say all of these things and calamities. Oh, look at these tornadoes and oh, help me with these earthquakes and hallelujah, please help me. God. No, they were saying salvation belongs to our God. Uh, who sits where? On the throne. Hallelujah. That, that to me encourages me, uh, friends of mine, because uh, if the throne is absent, that means that uh, we don't have a true progenitor. We don't have uh, a person who's in control. God is not frantically standing, pacing the throne room, wondering what he's going to do in these last days. He's got a plan, and he's sitting down on the throne. I said he's sitting down on the throne, and uh, we're saying 
Now, in acknowledgement of where he sits, we also want to acknowledge him as being our God. But not only that, our God, he's also our lamb. Amen. Who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Why is that important? It's important to verify who he is. He is the lamb slain before the foundations of the earth. We know that text is in the Bible in that it reminds us that God made the decisions for our salvation before there was ever a star put into the sky, before there was a, ever a solar system, before there was ever a foundation of the earth, God put and instituted a ramification of a plan of salvation before there was ever a human being planted on this earth, before there was ever an animal, before there was ever any life ecosystem. The Bible says before the foundations of the earth, the lamb was slain, meaning he made up in his mind that you and I could have access to salvation. Now, are we saved? That that's thereby less, gives us the answer to this question by how we live, what we do, how we live and how we act and how we interact really uh, ver verifies whether or not we are receiving salvation. I know I have access to it, but whether or not I'm saved or not really is constituting to the fact of whether or not I'm choosing God to be on the seat of my throne, sealed in my forehead, sealed in my heart, sealed in the place where his, his seat of authority really is. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to our lambs and, and, to, and to the lamb. The Bible says in verse 11, and the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and around the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen. That's my favorite word. Amen. Meaning truth to everything that we have seen and everything that we've heard. Amen. Nothing can come against our God. Nothing's going to interrupt our salvation. Nothing can uh, get in between and hinder, as it were, God's access to his people. Amen. Amen to the fact that salvation belongs to God. It does not belong to any other man. It does not belong to your pastor. It does not belong to the Pope. It does not belong to the present. Salvation belongs to our God. The dictations of our society do not mitigate or, 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 or migrate this, this access and authority away from God. He is the one who has complete authoritative stance over our salvation. Now you should be shouting hallelujah where you are right there in your place of, of dwelling because the reality still remains the same that we are running around here running to and fro and we need to recognize where it is that our authoritative stance for salvation really is. It's in Christ Jesus and it's in the Lamb of God. Listen to these angels. I don't, I don't know if you can hear them or these 24 elders, these four creatures, says they, fa they fell down on their faces. Let me ask you, when's the last time you fell down on your face before God? When is the last time you fell down on your face before God because you recognized that you could not produce salvation? When is the last time you were in awe of your salvation? When was the last time you set aside some time just to worship God because he was the lamb that is slain before the foundation? When is the last time you celebrated our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for making an atonement on our behalf when there was no angel, when there was no blood of a bull or blood of a, a lamb, any other natural lamb that could have taken the place and given us access to that. When is the last time you fell down on your face? Well, I submit to you, believer of God, that today seems like a good day to fall down on our faces. Today seems like a good outlook for us to fall down on our faces and worship God, saying amen. Truth to everything that we have seen from the word of God, everything that we have heard from the word of God. And they say this, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength. <laughs> Hallelujah. That just sounds good to me. I want to hit rewind. I want to say it one more time because it made me feel like I'm in contact with the atmosphere of heavenly places. Um, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Get the amen sandwich. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? 
And I answer, Sir, you know. From the King James, Sir, thou knowest. Uh, and he said, These are they. Uh, that's the constitution of our study on today, trying to verify who these are. Um, these are they, uh, the Bible says, uh, if you have the question, who have come out of, listen to them, great tribulation. I want to pause here parenthetically and just insert into your devotional experience um, that the fact that us trying to pray away tribulation really um, is anti-biblical. Uh, yes, we should pray like Jesus did in the garden, and he said, if there's any other way, Lord, let this cup pass, but let your will be done and not my will. That's where we have to get in our access of growth, in our spiritual journey, where we're not just praying away the tribulation, but we recognize we don't need to pray it away. We need to ask that God would help us to be sustained in the midst of tribulation. Uh, somebody needed to hear that today because you're going through, as it were, some terror in your home. The terrorist has locked us down, as it were. Uh, making us fearful of the atmosphere that even going outside may produce some ill um, productivity or ill atmospheres of, of, of injustice on our bodies. But the reality is we need to recognize that tribulation is not something that we can escape. Tribulation is God's tool of making us a prepared people. So when we pray away tribulation, we're actually praying away the hand of God. I'll say it again. When we pray away tribulation, we're actually praying away the hand of God, that molding hand of God. Yes, the Bible says he breathed the breath into our nostrils, but he created us with his hands. He formed us, the Bible says, from the dust of the earth. And as it were, um, he also allows us to recognize that even in tribulation, he's forming our characters. He's forming who it is that we need to be in these last and evil times. Friend of mine, let me tell you, you don't need to be scared of terror. Um, if it has been pre-prophesied in the Bible, according to Elder Renrick John, that means that we can have verified um, positivity in our atmosphere because we recognize if God proclaimed it, that it means he can sustain us in it. So if God proclaimed that terrors and tribulations would come, then that means he also has the incubator, as David says, hide me under your wings. He didn't say take me out of it. He said hide me in the midst of it, meaning protect me while I go through this. And that is what we need in these last days, a prayer that helps us to pray to be tribulation ready. Um, and then he says, sir, thou knowest these are they who have come out of great tribulation, meaning this is the after effect of what we're going through now as we see the end of time. Um, the end of time is relative to a date or relative to or is not relative to a date or, or a timeline. Um, it is simply a period where God is going to wrap things up. Uh, we know that they will happen in a fast-paced manner. We just don't know the time frame as according to our, our watches. We don't know the day or the hour, as the Bible says, and we shy away from that because we've learned from our forefathers that that is no salvation in trying to set a time and, and trying to set a date. We know for sure that we are, have been given, according to the Bible, a set amount of time, but we also know that our lives are as a vapor, meaning we may not live to the last second of time, but we may live to the fullness of time in our experience. Let me just make that clear again. You may, you and I may die before we see Jesus come into the cloud. You and I may die before we see the seven last plagues according to what the Bible talks about. You and I may die before that time, but you better believe that we, we should be thankful that salvation belongs to God in it that you and I don't set the standard of how I'm going to get in or how you're going to get in. It is God's word that sets the standard of how we are living, how we're breathing, and how we're having our being. And it is that, yes, tribulation will come, but it does not uh, constitute to us an exact time where we'll be standing and waiting for the return of the Lord. Uh, most of us will be laid to rest in it that we cannot handle the times that are to come, but the reality remains the same. All of us are going to go through tribulation. We may not go through the last tribulation, but all of us right now are going through verifiable tribulations. Man, this word of God is so good to me. I'm thankful today. 
Uh, because sometimes when I get in the midst of my tribulation, I need to tribulation. I need to recognize that salvation belongs to God. Uh, when, when I'm getting uh, destitute of my hope and my, my trust in God, I need to be reminded that uh, salvation belongs to God. Um, I need to re be reminded of the of the celebratory prayer uh, that my brothers and sisters and even uh, ourselves, because this is the after effect of the, the 24 elders and the angels begin to pray this prayer. They say praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength belong to God, not just for a moment, not when I'm feeling good, not when I'm feeling bad, but always, the Bible says, forever and ever, amen. That's something we all need to rest in our spiritual experiences. Salvation belongs to God. There, there is so many things that are happening around us today. We need to recognize that God is still in control. Somebody needed to hear that today. Um, I got a smile on my face because I believe that, yes, uh, these are the last moments, but I believe that God is making our calling and election sure. I believe that God is helping us to prepare for what it is that we need in these last days. I believe that he's allowing us to pick up the phones and call family members we haven't talked to in a long time. I believe that he's allowing us to now pray prayers that we would have never prayed in our comfortable atmospheres. I, I believe that God is helping us to put one foot in front of the other and walk out our salvation even while we're exercising in the flesh and in the spirit. I believe that God is giving us the power and the strength and the wisdom. Yes, they belong to God and they are to God, but he's also imparting wisdom in these last days. He's also giving us power and strength to endure in these last days. If they all belong to God, well, hallelujah, I'm thankful that I'm a child of the living God. And if I were to ask anything from God, God, being my father and me being his child, he's going to give it to me because he knows how to give good gifts. Hallelujah, somebody. He knows how to give me strength when my strength is failing. He knows how to give me power when I'm feeling weak. He knows how to give me, hallelujah, what I need in the moment when I'm feeling destitute. Yes, it is to God, but it also is to his children. Hallelujah, that we have power and strength and wisdom that has been given to us by our God. He's covering us even in tribulation. Man, I, I thought I was going to preach something else, but this thing is so good to me um, because we need to recognize not only has he fitted us for this great tribulation, but he's also washing our robes. Hallelujah. He's washing our robes, meaning he's coming into us and he's getting on the inside of us. He's no longer around us. He's he is infecting us. He is coming on the inside and now making uh, what it is that is wrong right. He is righting our wrongs and making our wrongs covered by his righteousness. He is washing our robes, meaning he is not only doing character development, but he's also helping us to get our personality together as well. He is helping us to get out those evil traits of, uh, of greed and doubt and fear. He's coming on the inside of us and washing us with our robes so that we can be covered by his righteousness. Yes, we're in the midst of tribulation, but thanks be to God, it's greater than tide. Come on and say amen. It's greater than surf. It's greater than any washing detergent. He is washing us from the inside. Out. Yes, he's covering us on the outside, but hallelujah, he's getting on the inside and he's washing out all those defects and all those character flaws and all those personality quirks. He's helping us to look just like he looks. Oh, hallelujah, somebody. Man, I, I just got excited. I'm going to exit stage left right here right now. Because I need, I need someone to hear this word today. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us right now. He's helping us to see that, yes, salvation belongs to God. Heaven is not scared. The 24 elders aren't concerned about COVID. They are simply focusing in on what matters most, and salvation belongs to our God. Hallelujah, somebody. Mm, hallelujah, somebody. Salvation belongs to our God. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Salvation belongs to our God. I don't know if you're in a place right now where you were 
uh, trivializing the grace of God. But right now, you need to just celebrate the salvation of God. Thanks be to God that he is not concerned about COVID, but he's getting our characters together and washing us and getting us prepared for the atmosphere of heaven. Thank you, Jesus. I wouldn't have gotten this two weeks or four four months ago. I wouldn't have gotten this six months ago. I wouldn't have been open like I am open right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for getting on the inside and wakening us up with tribulation. Oh, yeah, it's tribulation, but it's not the great one that is to come this Bible is talking about. But these tribulations are going to be ongoing. This great tribulation is, in, in essence, not just a one-time period. It is a succession of the tribulations that are in culmination of the devastation that you and I will experience. Some of us will not get to the biblical revelation great tribulation, but some of us are facing individual tribulations all the way through. And here's the newsflash. Salvation belongs to God. Hallelujah. Grace belongs to God. All of these greatness and, and, and this, this wisdom and, and thanks and, and honor and power and strength belong to God. And if they belong to God, child of God, uh, they also belong to you. And whatever you're needing today, whatever you're standing in need of right now, I just want you to press heaven on your, on his, on your behalf, on your family's behalf, on your neighbor's behalf, and ask God those gifts that are his, the things that we celebrate him for, Oh, let me let me go down this lane because I know this makes some people upset. Um, but uh, hey, I, I gotta make you upset in order for you to get uh, upright. Come on and say amen. Um, um, how can we just sit around here with our hands folded in our laps in these last days and wondering and wringing our hands, wondering what's going to happen? None of these things matter, but my praise matters. Hallelujah. Uh, my worship matters. My focus matters. They didn't talk about COVID in the Bible. They didn't talk about all these things that are happening. They mentioned them. They sectioned them off. But you will find in the Bible they are praising God more than they are praising their tribulation. They are celebrating the triumph of God over our tribulation. And they're saying, yes, they've come out of great tribulation, but they are, he's also washing our robes. Uh, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. I submit to you today before this Sabbath ends, this seventh-day Sabbath, this Bible Sabbath, this signature of God's Sabbath, um, uh, I, I want to put it to you that you fall on your face this day. That's my challenge and charge to you today, that you will fall on your face and forget about your troubles and tribulation and celebrate and praise God that he's the all-wise God. I want you to put out of your mind COVID-19 and not being able to be in the brick and mortar. And I need you to praise uh, the God who has given you that, yes, thanks even belongs to God. Honor belongs. You need to celebrate God in this moment that he's not relinquished these things, even though tribulation is, is happening around us. Oh, man, I'm done with the word. But here's that simple appeal. Um, don't let anything block my view from heaven. If I want to be these of they, if I want to be these last day individuals, please, God, do not let tribulation, even though it's great, block my view of your wisdom, of your power, of your truth, oh God, of even thanks and honor. Please don't let it block my view of who you are. That's the word for today. Um, it's not just going to be given to God for a moment, and it was never given to God. They are God. Wisdom is God. Uh, power is God. That, that's God's. No one gave it to him. But here's what we can give God today. We can give him our attention and we can give him our hearts. We can give him the people in our homes, whether they're in the building frame of our homes, or we can give them where they are. They're our children home. They're our, 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 our mothers and fathers, our, our, our family. We, we, can, we can transcend our quarantine and allow the prayer, prayers and intercessions to now go wider and bigger than they ever have. I'm challenging you, uh, saint of God. I'm challenging you uh, in these last moments, um, because when I say last moments, it could be 10 years, it could be 10 days, it could be one day. I don't know. But in these last moments, I know I don't have all, all, all eternity yet. Amen. But in these last moments, I'm challenging you um, to not allow your, the tribulation to outweigh what God is doing right now. 
That's what you need to be mindful of. What is God doing right now? Well, as I said before, he's not afraid. He's not even concerned. He is praying for us. He is interceding. For, and that's what we need to do right now. Uh, we, need to, we, need to, we need to touch and agree right now and pray and praise. Pray and praise. I like that. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Pray and praise. Put our face down on our carpets. Humble ourselves before God. Put our spiritual agenda aside and say, God, honor and power and wisdom and thanks belong to you. Thank you, Lord. Get a spirit of thanksgiving of what God is doing while the government can't even figure out what to do. <laughs> the earthly government can't even figure out what to do. God is seated on his throne. Hallelujah, somebody. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Elder Rimlet John, for leading us in this uh, Sabbath school lesson. Uh, the Bible is, is giving us all authority. Do you feel that right now? I mean, can you feel that? It doesn't take brick and mortar for us to be in the same building to get this spiritual touch from God. Um, but as you are feeling that, and I do not want to trivialize church and us gathering together. That's not what I'm doing. Be mindful of that, all you Pharisees and, and Sadducees. Uh, what I am saying is that, that this spiritual experience is far bigger than we ever conceptualize. That God is bigger than a building. He is on the inside of us. The church is us. We are the church. He's been reminding East Market Street of that ever since we've gone through our challenges. But as I'm wrapping this message up, this message up, I want you to, as I said before, number one, let our prayer and praise be what we're focused on when we put our faces to the ground. We don't look up today. I want you to, I want you to do the letter of the law today. All right. Uh, call, call me weird all you want to, but biblically, I want you to. Get on your face with your family today. This is not a game. This is not in fashion. If you're able, please, if you cannot get down, don't get down. Put your face down to the earth. If, you're, if you are incapacitated, I'm not telling you you have to physically do this, but if you're able to get down and put your face down, I want you to start praising God for the, all the things that he's doing for you in spite of what has been taken away from you. Yes, we may be jobless. Yes, we may have great bills that are facing us. Yes, we haven't seen the worst that is to come, but God is still on the throne. Hallelujah, somebody. I'm done. Ah, I'm done. I'm done, but he's not. Come on and say amen. Amen. I'm, I'm glad he hasn't said those words as of yet, but they are coming when he says it is finished. One day he's going to whisper those words. Uh, Jesus is going to uh, mount his horse. Come on and say amen. I'm, I'm getting ready now. It's, it's, yeah, I'm feeling this thing. Come on and say amen. Uh, he's going to mount his horse, horse um, that white horse, um, and the Bible says it's written on his side, the word of God. Come on and say amen. The, the, the written word has now become the living word, and the living word is going to come for his individual words that he's deposited in the earth. God the Father is going to say, it is finished. I'm done. I'm done with receiving the intercessions of Jesus, but thanks be to God, he's not done yet. Come on and say amen. Right now, you can get a prayer through. Hallelujah. So he's still on the throne, and Jesus is still in the heavenly sanctuary praying for us. So we ought to pray not just for ourselves, but pray for our families and pray for our enemies and pray for the governments and pray for those who do not yet know God. Pray, pray for the atheists and pray for the homosexuals and pray for, for the cancer victims and pray for the arrogant and pray for everybody. Put your face down. And allow God to lift up individuals that are around you. I'm challenging you to do this today. Yes, great, tribu great tribulation is coming. Um, just a small tribulation is happening now. But great tribulation is coming. I'll say it one last time. But he's still seated on his throne. Hallelujah. 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 And he's washing our robes. Hallelujah. He's preparing us for eternity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, 
In the name of Jesus, we humble ourselves before you now. We've been running around here thinking that we could do it our own way. But God, we realize that access and salvation belongs only to you. You're granting us access into heavenly places to even read about it, but our hearts are there. Our citizenship is there. You're giving us access to places that we don't even belong, but thank you for covering us. Thank you for giving us what we need now, God, in these last and evil days. We praise you and give you glory. Thank you that wisdom belongs to you and even thanks belongs to you and honor belongs to you and power belongs to you and strength strength belongs to you. Thank you, God, not just for this moment, but forever and ever. You can outlast even our tribulation. Father, we pray for our families who don't want to do anything with you because we raised them the wrong way. We were too hard on them. We were whipping them with the Bible. We were running them down with doctrines and truths, and we were trying to force them to be ready. But God, Holy Spirit, correct us now and go and get our children who care not about the word, even those who think they are saved and say, Lord, please cover our children whether they are now 50 or 60 or, or 5 or 6, or it doesn't matter, God, cover our families, God. Cover our spouses and cover, cover, Lord, our hearts. And please, God, wash our robes. Wash our robes. Lord, please don't let us going back to business as usual as they're opening up these states. Help us not to forget these moments and how you gave us a pause to get our time and timing right and help us to see that, yes, Lord, you're soon to come, whether it's 10 days or 10 years or 100 years from now. God, we won't live 100 years, so our salvation is right now. Today is the day of our salvation. Today. God, we, we come and covenant with you that later on today, before the sun kisses the earth and this Sabbath rest flees from this earth, while your presence is poured out in these 24 Hours, God, help us before this sun sets that we'll put our face down. Oh, God, so you can lift our faith up. Put our face down so that you can put our faith up. Well, we pray for Brother Fuel. We pray for his mind, body, and most of all, his soul. We pray. We covenant, oh God, that you are the healing God. There are many who are going through procedures. We pray for Sister Ayers, who has a procedure coming up. We pray, God, that you will cover, as she said this week, her promise that she's holding, that no plague will come nigh her dwelling. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Mm, 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 mm. Amen. Salvation belongs to our God. God bless you, saints. Oh, saints of the living God, God bless you. You go throughout this week, keep reminding yourself, making your calling and your election sure. Man, don't worry about all these last days. Just worry about today. <laughs> worry about, uh, be not worry, but be concerned about and be cautious about how we walk through the day. Let God, thank you, uh, Brother Tommy Fox, cover you with his wings. God bless you, um, Sister. Uh, <laughs> these are they. Yes, yes, these are they. These are they. God bless you, uh, sister. I'm not sure if I got your your audio straight, but we'll put you in tab to uh, sing the uh, song, word and song for us on next week, if you don't mind. Um, salvation belongs to our God. 
Man, you don't get better. You don't get better than this right here. Salvation. I got. I got. I got. I got to get off this line, man. I'm. I'm. I'm about to go in for round two on this thing. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Have an on fire week. An awesome, awesome week. Continue to allow God to use you. Um, he's doing some amazing things in these last days. He said that the time of the end would be a time of trouble such as there never was. So we can expect to see the move of God like we've never seen before. Be encouraged, saints. Um, God is still covering you. Uh, we're praying for Brother Fuel, but please put your faith down today and put your faith in God. God bless you.